Hello, today's lecture is focusing on the operation strategy matrix. This was developed by Nigel Slack and Michael Lewis, and you'll find details of it in your textbook. But I really wanted to give some insight into how we might apply this in making sense of an operation or a global supply chain in terms of strategic decision making. The first thing we have to take into account is that at the best, we're going to try and aim for some form of reconciliation between the marketplace and our operations resources. Quite simply speaking, marketplace has requirements that are dynamic, they're constantly changing, depending on where you're uh, marketing your products around the world, you'll have very different expectations uh, from your consumers. No two consumers are the same, so we have heterogeneity between requirements of individual customers. This is even more important when you're looking at business to business markets, where dealing with one large corporation can be very different from dealing with another corporation. And finally, there's some degree of ambiguity. Consumers don't always know exactly what they want. They don't always know exactly why they buy the things they do. They don't always know exactly why they choose you. In business to business markets, that ambiguity may be, how shall I put it, a little bit more contrived. In other words, sometimes your buyer might not tell you the exact truth about how well you're doing. So market requirements, pretty messy, pretty dynamic, constantly changing, very difficult to get to grips with. Now, if we take a look at our operations resources, on the other hand, they're very difficult to change. You think about um, an organization like Starbucks moving into a whole new world um, away from coffee and baked goods, um, but maybe moving into being some more of a service provider. Very difficult for them to do that. They don't have the resources necessary. Partly that's because they're technically constrained. If you have a, a, a Starbucks um, store, it has its baristas, it has the coffee making equipment, it has refrigerators, it has tables and chairs. Converting that into, say, a spa would essentially uh, involve starting all over again. And for me, one of the beauties, in fact, of supply chains and operations is that it's very complex. It may not be rocket science. But there are so many steps, so many things involved in delivering a good or a service to the end consumer that it can get really messy. And that's what we mean by complexity. So on the one side, we've got this amorphous, difficult to nail down uh, market requirements. And on the other side, we have operation resources, which are pretty complicated, technically constrained, a lot of money tied up. So how do we go about managing that clash between the nature of requirements and our operations resources. Well, for some companies, it's not so easy. Let's think of American Eagle. They clearly compete on a low cost focus. That's why they're constantly looking at should we source in China or should we source in Mexico? What's the exchange rate doing? Very much short term operations capab capability. Move on to a company like Flextronics, and here's an example of their facility in Guadalajara, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to imitate. A lot of their technology is proprietary. They've dedicated millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in the infrastructure and uh, in the technology that they use uh, to manufacture their products. They have a medium term operations capability and that's indicated very much by how long it takes them to change. Let me take somebody like South African Breweries, one of the two biggest breweries in the world. Um, started off with a, um, a South African base, spread that capability north, then moved into Europe and Asia through acquisition as well as uh, organic expansion. It's almost impossible to imitate what South African brewers have done because of their complex integrated global network. But that doesn't think, mean that all things are rosy. I mean, think, for example, of what are they going to do in developed markets? How are they going to compete against the major players? Local breweries, craft breweries, established breweries. Well, that was where their acquisition came in. Very long-term operation strategy. 20 years easily to see the growth of South African breweries. So we've seen that markets and operations have very different characteristics. 
we also see that different organizations have different time horizons in terms of their focus on operations. And I'd refer you to one of our other videos in this course where I'm talking to Professor Nigel Slack about the difference between operations strategy and operational. And I think that will help elaborate further on this point. So how do we go about developing our operations strategy? Well, first and foremost, what can an operations bring us from a strategic point of view? It can give us quality. Quality of experience, quality products, quality processes. In other words, being right. It can give us speed, being quick. When I think about the order I placed yesterday on Amazon Prime for a t-shirt, and it arrived this morning, that's less than 12 hours for delivery. That's very impressive. Not as impressive as two-hour delivery, which Amazon are offering to Prime customers, for example, in the United Kingdom. Dependability, being on time. That's not the same as being quick. If I say that, you know, I will be there to repair your plumbing leak uh, in four hours, and I'm there in four hours, I can plan around that. If I say I'm going to deliver to Walmart at 10.15 to 10.30, then they can plan around it. Being able to do what you say you're going to do, being able to repeat it. Uh, the best embodiment of this is, is the classic example about uh, Japan Railways, who have a phenomenal on-time reliability metric, where a cumulative lateness of seven minutes a year for any individual driver is about the limit. So it's very impressive. People expect the service to be there when they want it. Flexibility, being able to change, being able to change the products, the product mix, the speed, the markets. Um, flexibility is a whole bag of capabilities. And then finally, cost. Cost is never unimportant, but it's not always the reason we get the business. But if we do, competing on cost means we've got to be productive. And this is really how we define our competitiveness. First and foremost, how do operations give competitive advantage? Secondly, what do our marketplaces require in terms of these configuration of these five criteria? Again, I'd refer you to the presentation on order winning criteria that you'll find uh, in the course. That will help you surface a little bit more how we define the specific order or priorities that each of these criteria may have. Now, when it comes down to how do we deliver those capabilities, we have to take decisions, firstly, about capacity structure. How big? Um, Nigel Slack often contends that capacity is the most fundamental strategic question. How big do we want to be? Where? What are we going to do at each facility? Secondly, surround supply network. Who does what? Where? Do we do it? Do we outsource it? Do we have a close collaborative relationship? How do we manage the flow of goods, services, and information through our supply chain? Thirdly, it's around our process technology. To what extent are we using automated technology? What is our rate of change of technology? You, for example, are studying this course using an online platform. Do we want to make sure that 100% of all of our students' experiences are online, 70%, 50%. How do we expand that across all of our programs? That's a key question that illustrates the process technology issue in operations strategy. And then finally, what has been called the touchy-feely side of things, the development and organization. There's a line in one of our case videos where um, the presenter, a guy called Sid Joinson, says, you know, I often ask, how often do these robots come up with uh, improvement suggestions? And the answer is none. And that's really at the, the heart of this, which is that we can automate to our heart's delight, but people are the innovators, the creators. People are how we are going to drive forward. We've also got to think about aligning how we manage people with the needs of our marketplace. So performance management is pretty key here. And these, these four elements, these four building blocks, are what constitute the core decision areas in operations strategy. And therefore, that's where our competencies and also our constraints may lie. So how do we 
uh, build or how do we analyze an operation strategy? This is where the operation strategy matrix comes into play. Clearly, we need to understand how we compete in our marketplace. What are the quality, speed, dependability, flexibility, and cost dimensions? What do they mean? Secondly, think about the decision areas of capacity, supply network, process technology, and development and organization. When you're reviewing or developing operation strategy, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it comprehensive? Have we addressed all of these four decision areas and do we fully understand how we compete? What are the priorities? What are the order winners in each of our market segment? Secondly, what are the parts of this matrix that tell us this is critical? For example here, the size and location of our facilities is absolutely critical to supporting our cost competitiveness. Do we understand that and do it, does it make sense? So if we think uh, about Starbucks, for Starbucks, their, um, their coffee shops are roughly the same size as each other. They're located in neighborhoods. They're near roads. They're near busy footfall. So it's quite clear that the choice of location has been central. It's also helped them to keep their costs down. Some of their um, shops, slightly smaller, are in shopping malls. Some of them are at airports. Higher rental cost, they bring the size down. Lower rental cost, slightly larger. If you think about supply network, Walmarts uh, have very strict requirements that A, they don't want to hold inventory in their stores. B, if you're a supplier, you've got 15 minute to 20 minute windows to deliver. If you don't deliver in those time windows, say between 10.15 and 10.30, you've got to wait till the back of the queue. So we want suppliers who can deliver on a just-in-time basis. 7-Eleven Japan, um, if you read through that case study, that's even more profound, how much they depend on just-in-time, reliable deliveries. If we think about process technology giving us flexibility back to what we're doing, using Blackboard, using an online uh, platform, means that if, for example, you can't attend campus, because you're on business travel, as long as you've got internet access, you can still be a student. And then finally, the development and organization dimensions in terms of helping to improve productivity, being quick, being skilled, or in the case of Taylor Guitars, thinking about how um, their employees are passionate about the product that they build. They give a lot of care and attention. They intervene if they see things going wrong. That's very important for Taylor Guitars. Thirdly, we have to think about coherence. Given how we compete, for example, on quality, do our decisions support that? Do the investment decisions we take, do the uh, performance management systems we use, do our sourcing decisions, do they make sense? Do they feed in? Do they support quality? And then the final uh, dimension is this issue of correspondence. In other words, the decisions we take about capacity strategy should reflect how we compete in our markets. So in a nutshell, when you're doing your final project analysis, I want you to use the operation strategy matrix. I want you to be thinking about how well your chosen organization meets these criteria of comprehensiveness, correspondence, coherence, and criticality. I also want you to use the matrix to help propose areas where there could be potential improvement. I look forward to seeing your work.